All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Scharf, and together with Jessica Berg, who's 
sitting right there. Uh, we are the co-deans of Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and it's my privilege, having flipped a coin um, with Jessica, to welcome you all to our annual Summer Canary Lecture, which is one of the law school's premier endowed lectures. And it brings extraordinary jurists, like the one we have today, to the school to discuss current legal issues. We have many events at the law school, and we're going to have a big one on Friday, and I want to encourage you to think about coming. Um, that is our Art of International Law Conference. It's from 9 to 5 o'clock. Um, the lunch discussion features the president of the Art Museum across the street, and we're going to talk about all of the times that the Art Museum has had international legal issues with its famous artworks. Um, so definitely come if you can on Friday. This lecture series, which is one of our finest, was established to honor the memory of the late Judge Summer Canary, a judge on the Ohio Court of Appeals for the 8th District and a U.S. attorney in the Northern District of Ohio, and he was a 1927 graduate of this law school. This lecture series is made possible through the generosity of his widow, Nancy Canary, who has joined us here today. Where is Nancy? There you are. Thank you. Good to see you again. Well, we are very honored to have Neil Katyal as our 2016 Canary Lecturer. I'm not going to tell you much about him because that's going to fall to my colleague, but Neil is a former Acting Solicitor General of the United States. At the age of 46, he has already argued more cases in U.S. history than has any racial minority attorney, with the exception of the great Thurgood Marshall. One of the most distinguished and frequently cited chair professors on our faculty, Jonathan Adler, who is also the director of our Center for Business Law and Regulation, will now tell you more about Neil and kick things off. Thank you all very much. Um, thank you. Um, well, a couple really brief housekeeping uh, items. One is after the lecture, uh, we're pleased to host a reception in the lower rotunda, um, so, so please join us there uh, immediately following the lecture. Uh, one other event, just to note really quickly, on uh, Friday, September uh, 23rd, uh, the Center for Business Law and Regulation is hosting a conference on business in the Roberts Court right here in this room. Uh, for those that are worried about their CLE, four and a half hours of CLE credit are available, uh, but we'll, we'll be looking at uh, how the Roberts Court has approached issues relating to business law and whether the Roberts Court deserves the reputation of being pro-business. Uh, with that out of the way, it's really my distinct honor and privilege to introduce uh, today's uh, Canary Lecturer. Uh, Professor Katyal, as you've already heard, is former Acting Solicitor General of the United States. He is currently the Paul and Patricia Saunders Professor of National Security Law at the Georgetown Law Center, Georgetown University Law Center. He's also a partner at Hogan Lavelle's. He's not only argued, I believe it's 28 cases before the Supreme Court, he has six more this term, five more this term. Um, uh, uh, really, uh, it, it is not an exaggeration uh, to say he is uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, appellate advocate of his generation. Uh, in addition to having been the Acting Solicitor General, he was uh, Special Assistant to the Deputy Attorney General. He clerked for Judge Guido Calabresi on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. He clerked for Justice Stephen Breyer on the U.S. Supreme Court. In 2011, he was awarded the Department of Justice's highest honor as a recipient of the Edmund Randolph Award. Um, among his cases in which he argued for the Supreme Court are cases like Hamdan versus Rumsfeld, uh, which are certainly quite important in cases that uh, we study and assign to our students and will for many years to come. Perhaps of, uh, of interest to, to some of you as well, he uh, had a, a brief appearance in season three of House of Cards. Um, <laughs> but you didn't come here to listen to me. Uh, I certainly know that's true of the students who here probably think they hear more than enough of me as it is. Uh, so without any further ado, it's really my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Neil Katyal to talk about institutionalizing dissent. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a real delight to be here um, with all of you um, for the Judge Canary Lectures. Um, and Ms. Canary, thank you very much for, for hosting me. Um, so I'm going to give a um, more pop version of something that is, I think, a bit of an academic uh, uh, project. It's going to ultimately be a book. I've written 78 single space pages. You, I have spared you the 78 single space pages today. Um, 
but ultimately it will be a book and it's called Institutionalizing Dissent. Uh, so um, I come here with a dose of humility. I, I, you know, I recognize that it's, you know, 4.30 in the afternoon um, and, you know, I, my, my students at Georgetown tell me I have a soporophic effect on them in general. Um, and so, you know, this was really brought home to me uh, a few years ago. We had, um, uh, we, at Georgetown, we have, I, I think you do it here, you don't put your names on exams, right, if you're a student. So, you know, and, and that was for good reason. I think, you know, a while ago at Georgetown, you used to put your name on the exam. And, you know, as a student, you would also kiss up to the professor the whole time, uh, the whole semester. And then you'd see, oh, Mary Jones, she's so sweet. And it'd be hard to, you know, distance yourself from that. So we now have these, like, number systems. You get exam 4829 or whatever, and you grade that. Um, but... Um, I guess, you know, it was several years ago, um, you know, that system works pretty well, but several years ago, you know, I started noticing students had some ways around that. So even at exam 4289, it would say at the bottom of the exam, like, Professor, you wear such beautiful ties, or, <laughs> you know, your children are so cute. That one, of course, got to me, um, uh, you know, and you can discard all that. But, you know, I had this exam a few years ago, and it said, Professor, should I have one hour left to live? I should like to live it in your class. And I'm thinking, God, do we give A pluses at Georgetown? You know, this is really good. And then it's a footnote, because, you know, it's a law student exam. They love their footnotes. And footnotes has turned the page over. That is because, Professor, you make one hour seem like an eternity. <laughs> so, so we got an hour. <laughs> good luck. Um, so, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, drone strikes. You know, if those phrases conjure up in your mind an image of an abusive government, you're certainly not alone. Over the past decade or so, people on both the left and the right have been very concerned about the abuse of government power. And that, of course, is magnified in the re with the revelations of Snowden, with NSA surveillance, uh, and so on. Um, and so today I want to talk about a path out of this. Um, it's a path laid down by America's founders who had the radical idea that every leader, no matter how wise, is going to make mistakes. And that true strength, the true measure of a country's greatness, is recognizing those mistakes, learning from them, um, and self-correction. And so the simple idea of the talk is to institutionalize dissent. Now that, I know, sounds oxymoronic. Dissent is, by definition, criticism, and the natural tendency of all governments is to suppress criticism. But that, of course, is not the genesis of America, which was rooted in this idea of freedom of speech and freedom to criticize, as well as linking it up to the division of powers, the great division, the three branches of government. And all of this, I think, can be understood as different mechanisms to harness dissent, and that's what I'm going to talk about um, today. So while we're far from 1787, the seeds of that spirit still exist in this country, and I think we can build upon them. And if we did so, I think it would be, help yield solutions to hard problems like drone strikes and surveillance policy and so much more. And indeed, I think if other nations follow that course, instead of as much political violence on the streets and the bloodshed that we see taking place all over the globe, I think would we'll start thinking about the government as a way to accommodate and flourish precisely because of dissenters and criticism in societies. So at its start, you know, um, uh, you know, the American government was the most, the American Constitution was the most democratic document the world had ever known at its time. Now, obviously, today we think about all the folks who weren't part of that, but it's important to remember all the folks who were part of it compared to the baseline of everything that had occurred before in human history. And at its root, it had the idea that government leaders are going to do the wrong thing. Madison and Federalist 51, all of you know, quote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. And so that's their central insight, to set up three branches of government precisely because we need government to control itself. We want to have dissent and disagreement within the government and rivalry in the government in order to yield better decisions. 
And this is something that I think, you know, the cyber law community has recognized for a long time. The idea that kind of the architecture, the way in which you design a system is going to impact behavior. Larry Lessig, you know, made a career out of this in the cyber law space, but writing a book called Code, all about this concept. And indeed, it's not a concept that's unfamiliar to people in architecture as well. The idea that if you lay out a room a certain way, such as everyone's, you know, uh, raised and looking at me, it's going to direct your attention this way. Of course, the room doesn't have to be laid out that way. And when cities are planned, you know, Jane Jacobs being, I think, the best example of this in her, in her, in her book about uh, Greenwich Village, The Death and Life of American Cities, you know, if you lay out a village in a certain, the village in a certain way, it's going to have certain impacts on who's interacting with who and how, uh, so how communities evolve. And so that's what the founders, I think, understood when they drafted, when they put these three branches of government together, three rivalrous power centers actually situated in different places, literally different buildings, indeed different cities, um, uh, you know, when it comes to, for example, the Supreme Court, which starts in New York. So all done with this idea of checking and balancing government power. And sometimes it works well, it works really well, this kind of conventional separation of powers. And how do I know this? Well, I'm a really good example of that. So, you know, a while back, um, you know, I was like, you know, many law professors, it was Saturday night and I was like thumbing through my constitution looking for grammatical errors or whatever con law professors do. Um, and, um, but this time it happened to be two months after the horrible attacks on our nation on September 11th. And so it was around, you know, the beginning of November and was that, now I remember it's November 13th, 2001. And, um, uh, and I'm watching the TV and, you know, CNN has that ticker thing at the bottom of its screen with the news that they had adopted in the wake of 9-11 so you could kind of see everything despite whatever was on the screen at the time. At that point, I think CNN used to carry news on the top of the screen. Um, but, um, uh, uh, and it said at the bottom, it said, President issues military trial order for suspected terrorists. And I thought, huh, that's really interesting because, you know, I was there during the embassy bombings at the Justice Department and we had thought about could we have military trials for the, you know, for the bombers of our embassies in, uh, in, um, in, in Tanzania and in Kenya. And, um, and the answer was no, you know, you need a law of Congress. So I said, huh, that's interesting. So I was, I was teaching in New Haven at the time and I was uh, living in, a, in, a, in, in someone else's house for the year and a professor was on leave. And so I, like, I used her dial-up internet, that's what they had then. And, um, uh, and so I type in, I typed in whitehouse.gov and I like looked at the screen and I saw, you know, there's click here for the presidential order on military trial, so I clicked there. And I read it, and my first reaction was, I thought it was a joke. Like, I thought I was on, like, a spoof White House website, um, because, like, I'm, the mo I'm a pretty deferential person when it comes to presidential power, but this was really extraordinary. The president was saying, I'm going to be able to handpick the people who are going to be put into these military trial system. I'm going to handpick the prosecutors. I'm going to handpick the defendants. I'm going to write all the rules for the military trials, define all the offenses, define what rights the criminal defendants have, which he literally said at one point, zero rights, um, prescribe the punishments, which of course included the death penalty. Um, and he said, I have the, I, I, he went so far as to say in the last lines of the order that the federal courts have no business reviewing what he's doing at Guantanamo. Now, I thought that went too far. So um, I was, again, just a lawyer. I'd not really litigated anything in my life, but I thought, you know, that uh, that it, it was important to, to, to try and, you know, examine that question. And ultimately, like I testified a couple of weeks later in the Senate, um, and then, because uh, the Senate held hearings on this, and then ultimately I brought a test case with, um, uh, with a wonderful judge, advocate general, a guy from the Navy, Charles, Lieutenant Commander Charles Swift, um, and then ultimately an international law firm, P Perkins Coie, fabulous firm, helped us bring this challenge. And basically we said, you know, that, uh, you know, that, uh, that the Constitution doesn't allow the president to set up the system on his own when Congress has said, here's how you're supposed to do trials, just kind of standard separation of powers uh, argument. 
And, I, you know, I remember, like, you know, it's very vivid in my mind. You know, everyone thought we were going to lose. And, you know, I had the, you know, we we're trying to figure out who the client would be. Um, you know, none of the clients are going to be ideal in one sense because, you know, it's, it's not as if Jonathan Adler is getting hauled before the military trials at Guantanamo. It's people who are accused of doing very, very bad things. And so, um, so, uh, so, you know, so I wound up representing Osama bin Laden's driver. Um, and, you know, that was obviously a concern, the optics of the case and so on, but ultimately argued the case. Um, and on June 28th, 2006, we found out we won. And I remember, you know, that the Justice Stevens had announced the opinion. It was 173 pages long. Uh, there were then dissents by Justices Scalia, Alito, and Thomas. Justice Thomas read his dissent from the bench, which he said he had never done before. He actually had done it before, but he had forgotten. Um, uh, and, um, uh, but in any event, all that went on in the courtroom for a bit more than an hour. Um, and then we went out of the court to just this huge media firestorm, hundreds and hundreds of cameras. And um, everyone, all the media is asking me, you know, what does this decision mean? What does it say? What does it say? And it was 173 pages long. You know, obviously we hadn't read it, um, but I knew what it basically said. You know, and I said, you know, I'd kind of thought about what we were going to say, and I said something, almost these words. I said, you know, here's what the decision means. It means that in America, you can have a man who is accused of being the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low, and you can, if you have a legal claim against, and you think you're being treated unfairly, and even if that claim is against the most important person, the most powerful man in the country, President Bush, indeed the most powerful man in the world, you can bring your claim, and you can bring it not just in some like local rinky-dink traffic court, you can bring it up to the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of the United States, and you can win. That's something profound about this country. In many other countries, Mr. Hamdan, the, the, my client, would have been shot for bringing his case. More to the point for me, his lawyer would have been shot. Um, but in America, it's different. It's special. The whole idea of America is that our leaders are going to make mistakes, and our system finds a way for it to work out. You know, John Roberts, when he testified to be Chief Justice in 2005, he said something similar. He said, the great thing about the Supreme Court is on the one side you can have the fancy corporation with all their fancy lawyers and their law books piled up high, and on the other side you can have the little guy who's got none of that, no fancy books, no fancy lawyers, but if he's got a good argument, he can win. Not always, but much of the time. And so... That's what got me thinking about our system, a system in which, you know, relatively insignificant players can have outsized impacts if the system is architected the right way and have outside impacts not by arms, not by armed revolution or things like that, but by working within the system that our founders thought that our system was robust enough um, to handle such dissent. Um, and indeed, I think the nation and world are better off because, in this case, the system recognized a mistake and it led to, for example, the Geneva Conventions now applying globally to the war on terror because that was also a big part of the case. And so, to me, that's the true message about what America is. I do think we are an exceptional country. I don't think we're exceptional just by dint of some divine right, but because our founders had this central idea now, I am by no means going to tell you a just-so story that this is America works, it's perfect, you know, we won this case, therefore everything's great. Of course not, of course not. And there have been many, many examples of the system going dramatically wrong. And I was deeply involved in reviewing one of them, which is, um, you know, as you know, law students here have studied the Japanese internment cases. Um, and so, you know, it's a very interesting story behind these cases. So, you know, we obviously have the attacks on December 7th, um, and two months later, uh, a military order is uh, ordered by the Army, um, supported by FDR, that imposes restrictions, quote, on all persons of Japanese ancestry, whether they are American citizens or not. And so they face curfews, they face exclusion orders, so they can't go to certain places on the coastline and things like that. And ultimately, they are removed from their homes, as everyone knows, over 100,000 of them. But to me, the really interesting story is actually the legal story. How does, how does that, um, how is that, how is this scheme defended? 
So you have actually a few really remarkable young uh, people, uh, young men, who rise to stand and challenge the system. And let me start, I'll tell you about two, but let me start with Gordon Hirabayashi. So Gordon is 18 years old. He's at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, and he was born in America. His parents were born in Japan. He'd never been to Japan. He's, a, you know, he's born in America. Um, and he is subject to the exclusion order and the curfew order. But he thinks it's deeply offensive, the idea that because uh, he is of Japanese ancestry, he should be treated any differently. After all, he is a U.S. citizen. So he violates the curfew and exclusion order one night and then goes and turns himself into the FBI. The FBI says, oh, you must be mistaken. You don't want to go to prison. Just go home. And he says, Hiribayashi says, you know, actually, I'm from a religious tradition very similar to Quakerism, and it's our duty to resist laws that we think are unjust, and that's what I'm doing. So, you know, if I've violated the law and there's some punishment, give me the punishment. So they give him the punishment. They haul him to, court, to, to, to jail, and they try him. And he defends himself at trial, saying this is unconstitutional and unjust, and he loses. And the judge then sentences him, and he says, Mr. Hirabayashi, I've got some bad news for you and good news. The bad news is you're convicted. The good news is we're fighting a war, and the closest prison we have for your offense is 1,000 miles away. It was called a prison camp. It's near Tucson, Arizona, about 30 miles out. And we don't have the resources to send you there. So you don't have to serve your sentence. We're going to just commute effectively your sentence, nullify it. And Gordon says, I'm a Quaker. I've been sentenced. I've got to serve my sentence. It's my duty to serve my sentence. And the judge says, sir, I have no way of getting you there. And he says, don't worry, I'll get there myself. So <laughs> this is, I mean, it's funny in a way, but it's really quite moving. I mean, Gordon hitchhikes the thousand miles to Tucson to serve his sentence. And he shows up late at the prison, and he goes to the warden, and the warden says, who are you? And Gordon explains the whole thing. He says, I have no papers of you. You don't have to serve your sentence. Don't worry about it. Go home. Gordon goes to the whole thing. I'm a Quaker, blah, 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 blah. And he then serves his sentence. Um, and again, you know, to me, that's kind of the spirit about what this country is. You know, there are a lot of people who wanted, I think, you know, justifiably so angry at the United States for doing this to them. And, you know, but, but he always thought the right thing to do is work within the system. So he brings his case, he brings his challenge, he's bringing it up to the Ninth Circuit. And, you know, then, like now, any, any court of appeals case has to be reviewed by the Solicitor General in Washington, D.C., and before it gets to the Solicitor General, it's reviewed by a line attorney in the office, one of the career officials. So the Solicitor General at the time is Charles Fahey. Um, and the line attorney who's reviewing it is a guy named Edward Ennis. Now, Ennis gets the case, and he says, and he starts looking into it and says, really, can we defend the idea that Japanese people, um, including U.S. citizens, should be subject to this? So he starts looking into it, and he learns about a Navy report written by Kenneth Ringel at the Office of Naval Intelligence. And that report says that only a tiny percentage of Japanese Americans are disloyal at most. The ones that are disloyal are already known to the government. And any other problems, if there's any concern, you can do any concerns by interviewing people selectively, anyone who seems suspicious. But that you don't need some en masse racial um, profiling thing. And the report, this is by the Office of Naval Intelligence, says, quote, the entire Japanese problem has been magnified out of its true proportions, largely because of the physical characteristics of the people. So it's a damning condemnation of the idea that you need this for some military reason. And indeed, the Navy is the one that has the lead on intelligence and counterintelligence operations in World War II, particularly on the Pacific Coast, where all this is taking place. So the lead intel agency is saying, we don't need this. All right. And by the way, the FBI, who's run by J. Edgar Hoover, agrees with the Navy on this. No fan of civil liberties, Hoover, but on this one, he is. So, Ennis writes a memo to the Solicitor General, to Charles Fahey, saying, quote, the Justice Department has to consider most carefully what our obligation to the court is. I think we should consider very carefully whether we do not have a duty to advise the court of the existence of the Navy report. It occurs to me that any other course of conduct might approximate the suppression of evidence. That's in the memo, suppression of evidence. 
What does Fahey do? Nothing. Zilch. Indeed, he orders the appeal in the Ninth Circuit, orders the Supreme Court brief defending this to say the same thing, which is mass internment is necessary to justify the survival, to, 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 to uh, ensure the survival of the United States. Indeed, he doubles down. He tells his deputy solicitor general to insert more facts about how the Japanese people can't be trusted. And there are 15 pages of facts, facts um, saying that Japanese Americans are going to, are, are creating Japanese schools for their children, which are fronts for indoctrination and propagation of nationalistic philosophy um, and the like. And so the Supreme Court upholds unanimously, Hirabayashi's conviction. And you could blame the court, and indeed I think most law schools, you know, most, most of the time today, that, that it's taught as we blame the justices um, for deferring to the president. But what isn't told is that the briefs of the government made these arguments. And the court, they're, five, they're nine generalist justices. They don't have intel reports. They don't, have, they don't have any way of understanding intelligence information. And the nation's top lawyer was telling them, you need to do this. We're fighting a war. Otherwise, the nation's survival could be threatened. So they did. And then the next year, you have Fred Korematsu's case, which I know is, is more familiar to many of you. And Again, like Hirabayashi, the most interesting thing about that case is what wasn't in the brief rather than what was. So, as I said, you know, every case is reviewed by a line attorney. And so the line attorney in Hirabayashi was Edward Ennis. And he's again the line attorney in, um, in the Korematsu case. And he gets another line attorney involved named John Burling. Now, John Burling is a, he comes from a legendary D.C. family. You've heard of the law firm Covington and Burling. That Burling is his dad. Okay, so he's, a, he's someone with a lot of gravitas in Washington, D.C. And Burling and Ennis start looking into this and whether or not they can justify what's going on in Korematsu, or justify the mass internment. And, you know, one of the things that happened in Hirabayashi is it was always a little bit of a shell game with the army that was trying to justify this. So, you know, first they said, you know, we, there's all these fronts for schools and you can't trust any of them. That was disproven. So then the new rationale was that Japanese Americans, these threat, these traders were going to the shores and they were gather, gathering information about our critical infrastructure and signaling it to Japanese submarines that were off the Pacific coast using mirrors and shortwave. Okay, so that was the theory. So that's the Army's writing a whole huge report saying this is going on, that we got to prevent Japanese Americans from getting to the coastline because then they'll signal to the submarines offshore that, you know, all this intelligence information. So the problem with this was that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which does communications, had looked into this and found zero evidence for this. There's nothing. And... So they write a memo to, to, uh, to the Solicitor General saying that the, fi that the final report of the Army is just completely made up. It's just not, there's no evidence to support what this is going on. And indeed, the Justice Department has, quote, substantially incontrovertible evidence that the Army knew this at the time they wrote the report. So they knew that the FCC had come to the opposite conclusion and they just whitewashed all of that. So... Burling writes the draft brief to the Supreme Court, disavowing all of this stuff about the army and saying, you know, none of this is true, um, as I think any government lawyer today would do, which is, you know, your solemn duty is to tell the truth to the court, and you can't shade it, particularly when it's an intelligence matter in which the other side doesn't have access to all of the information that you do. So that would be what happened today. That, of course, is not what happened back then. So Fahey looks at this draft report and says, there's no way I'm going to do this. It's going to, the War Department, now called the Defense Department, is going to get extremely upset, and we can't, we can't have that. So Ennis and Burling are really upset, and they are thinking of resigning from their job at the Justice Department. But before they resign, they decide to do something really unusual. Normally in Washington, if you, know, if, if you don't like what your boss is doing, you go to your boss's boss. Here would be the Attorney General. 
But um, they didn't do that because they didn't think the Attorney General was going to listen. They actually went down in the department. They went to the number eight person or so, the head of the criminal division. But the head of the criminal division was a guy named Herbert Wexler, legendary figure. He was a Columbia law professor. Those of you who've read the Model Penal Code, he wrote the Model Penal Code. So a very, very big deal. So they go to him and outline all of this, that, look, you know, here's what the Army says. Here's why it's just absolutely wrong. Here's what Fahey's doing. He's saying, don't tell the court any of this stuff. Only tell him what the Army said. How can we do that? And Wexler was also an ethicist. And so, um, so there's this whole memo that's written about this uh, from Ennison Burling to Wexler, and it says, don't we have a, quote, ethical obligation to the court to inform them that they shouldn't rely on the final report? It is highly unfair to this racial minority that these lies put out in an official publication of the Army go uncorrected. The Attorney General should not be deprived of the present and perhaps only chance to set the record straight. And Ennis and Burling say, we'll resign or we'll at least not sign our names to this brief unless... The, you know, unless all of this information is disavowed, all this army rationale. So Wexler says, uh, tries to reason with Fahey, the Solicitor General, gets pretty much nowhere. So then he says, all right, let's do a compromise. Let's try and paper over the difference. And so Wexler writes a footnote, and this is actually what appears in the Solicitor General's brief, quote, the final report of General DeWitt is relied on in this brief for statistics and other details concerning the actual evacuation and the events that took place. We have specifically recited in, the facts, uh, in this brief the facts relating to the justification of the evacuation, of which we ask the court to take judicial notice, and we rely on the final report only to the extent that it relates to such facts. Now, I've read this footnote 200 times. I still don't know what the heck it means, okay? So, and I think that was the point, was that he was trying to come up with a way to appease everyone. And, you know, that sometimes works. You know, in government interagency disputes, you know, Treasury wants one thing, the state wants another, and you figure, okay, well, let's just put something vague out there and, you know, kind of paper over the difference. Works pretty well. Um, you know, and when I was running the Solicitor General's office, I was always proposed and I always rejected it for a simple reason. It doesn't work at the Supreme Court because after you file the brief, there's this pesky little thing called an oral argument. And hey, you write something like that in your brief, you're going to get asked about it. So uh, Fahey goes to argue the case, Korematsu, and of course he's asked about it. And he's asked about it by Justice Jackson, who used to be the Solicitor General of the United States, who understood exactly that that footnote made no sense. And he says to him, are you disavowing the Army report uh, in the justification for the internment? That's what it sure sounds like. And this is when I really blame Fahey. This is Fahey's answer to Justice Jackson. Quote, there is nothing in the brief of the government which is, in this diff which is any different in this respect from the position it has always maintained since the Hirabayashi case that not only the military judgment of the general, but the judgment of the government of the United States in, in its entirety has always been in justification of the measures taken, and no person in any responsible position has ever taken a contrary position, and the government does not do so now. Nothing in the government's brief can be validly used to the contrary, end quote. That's after the FCC, that's after the Navy report, that's after Burling, that's after Ennis, that's after Wexler, and this is what he tells the U.S. Supreme Court. And so it's not surprising, again, that the U.S. Supreme Court, this time on a 6-3 to three vote, but upholds the Korematsu um, conviction. And, you know, when, 70 years later, when, when, when I got to hold the office, I got to look into this and uh, essentially confessed error and, you know, and said that what we did there was wrong as an office, that we, you know, and not just wrong on moral levels, which it deeply was, but, um, but wrong in terms of the obligation that the, court, that the Solicitor General, the executive branch, has to the judicial branch, that part of checks and balances, the only way it works, our founders designed, is if you actually have robust, true information coming forth. And in intelligence cases in particular, when you don't have the true adversarial testing system, because some of the information is only for good reasons held by the government, there's a special obligation uh, to make sure that you're forthcoming. So 
That's an example of where the inputs are being corrupted into the checks and balances system, and so the checks aren't working correctly. And so the question is, how do we make sure that these mistakes don't happen again? And that's what institutionalizing dissent is all about. And the answer to that is, we can't architect a system in which we are going to be error-free. That's just impossible. We don't want that. Our founders recognize men aren't, gonna, men aren't angels, and men and women now aren't angels, that people are going to make mistakes. Um, and so the idea is to design a system that A, tries to minimize mistakes from happening, and B, creates some self-corrective mechanisms afterwards. And a government can't do that very well if it's suppressing dissent, um, uh, both from the population as well as from the, within the government itself. And one of the most serious problems, I thought, in the war on terror policies enacted after September 11th was the way in which dissent was suppressed, in which decisions were compartmented among very, very few people um, on the Geneva Conventions, on, on Guantanamo policy, and things like that. And so I remember, you know, I, I guess it was three days before my very first Supreme Court argument, which was that Guantanamo case, I gave a paper at Yale. And, um, uh, you know, it was kind of crazy that I did that three days before, but, uh, but I did. And I remember, you know, and the paper was called Internal Separation of Powers. And the argument of the paper was you can create checks and balances within the executive branch itself, particularly when you have one party governments. At that point, the Senate and the Senate and, the, the Senate and maybe the House, I can't remember, and the um, presidency were, were held by Republicans and there wasn't much oversight going on. And I said, but sometimes you can create it within the executive branch itself. And I said that was important because it's really hard to imagine checks and balances working in military decisions because courts defer all the time to presidents in a time of war. You know, it's really hard if you're the president to lose a case at the Supreme Court if it's wartime. As I said to them, it's kind of like failing a class at Yale. You've got to really try to do it. Um, and, um, you know, and yet, actually, it turns out President Bush, you know, the Bush administration lost. You know, it's only happened really once before in our history in time of war um, that, you know, that we've had a rebuke of the president. That was the Youngstown case. But for President Bush, it happened four times. And why did that happen? Because there's nothing about President Bush, who was a good leader and so on. It was that the decisions that were being made were being made by such a small group of people that the existing institutional apparatus, for example, the judge advocates general, were cut out of this. You know, our top army and navy lawyers um, were entirely cut out of the decisions. And so, you know, one way of thinking about this is to say bureaucracy is not a dirty word. It, I know it is politically, but it's not always a dirty word. That sometimes you have expertise within a bureaucracy, and it's really important to tap into that empower some of those people. And for that to work, you need two things to happen. The first is you need some bureaucratic redundancy. You want to have overlapping jurisdiction. You know, if war is the continuation of politics by other means, then you ask, well, why do we have a war department or defense department? Why don't we just have a state department? But there's good reasons why you actually want to have rivalrous jurisdiction. And so that state and defense are going to come to different positions. You know, that Colin Powell when he is sitting as uh, Secretary of State, is going to come to different decisions than he did when he was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, for example. That's a good thing. It's even in today's paper. You know, it's made as a nefarious thing in the New York Times front page is, you know, state and defense uh, at serious conflict with each other over our Syria policy and how much to implement with Russia, um, with defense saying we don't trust Russia and states saying, we got to solve the Syria problem. That's good. We want to have that disagreement. That's going to yield a better outcome than only one side or only the other side. So that's one thing you want to do. And then the other thing you want to do is insist on civil service protections to make sure that, uh, that people feel empowered to actually raise their voices and so on. And so, you know, just to move this to, to speak to the academics for a moment, you know, sometimes this is seen as a threat to what's called the unitary executive model of the presidency. The unitary executive model of the presidency is this idea that says, I won the presidency, I get to control all of the decision making. Uh, you know, that the Constitution vests all of the executive power in one person, the president. And I don't disagree with that as a matter of constitutional law. I think that's absolutely right. The question is, how do you set up and design a system so that 
when stuff is teed up for presidential decision making, it's actually both sides are adequately being heard. Um, and the president, of course, has the raw power to do whatever he wants at the end of the day. But how do we make sure that the inputs that are coming in are, are the right way? So bureaucratic redundancy is one thing, kind of internal separation of powers. But the other thing that I want to highlight for you, and this is what you know much of the new work is about, is kind of um, it kind of what I call internal squared checks on government power. That is that it's not just state versus defense or commerce versus EPA that are creating internal checks and balances. It's actually checks and balances within any one agency itself that's going on right now. And so let me give you the best example of this. After 9-11, after the intel failures, the CIA created red cell teams. Now these are teams, their job is to go in and argue against the conventional wisdom. And those of you, I know there's some practicing lawyers out here, if you're in corporate law, you know this happens in a merger and acquisition. You know, GE is thinking of buying a company and Immelt is gonna say, hey, you know, and assign a certain group of people to say, hey, I want you to argue against this. Analyze why we shouldn't engage in this acquisition. Give me the best arguments, kind of devil's advocacy position. So that's what the CIA uh, has started to do with the red cells. There's all sorts of other stuff going on in the government um, like this. The kind of agency with the sub agencies stood up to argue against kind of the traditional mission of an agency. So, for example, the Defense Department has an office about humanitarian affairs in which their job is to defend, you know, rule of law and things like that. Things that the Defense Department, at least traditionally, wasn't as known for, perhaps unfairly. But, uh, you know, and it's commerce, for example, there'll be a group of people thinking about the environment. Um, at EPA, there'll be a group of people thinking about business interests. So the whole idea is to try and bring, build some of the dissent within, to, within the, uh, uh, within the uh, apparatus of the agency itself. So how could that be used a little bit when it comes to um, kind of hard government problems? I promised at the beginning to talk about some of those hard problems um, like drone strikes. Well, here's one interesting model, um, and it's the model I know the best, the Solicitor General's model. So the Solicitor General's model, you know, which does work in an adversary system, it's, you know, we as lawyers are built around the idea that you assign one side and the other side and generally you get truth. But sometimes you have obligations at a government law, as a government lawyer which transcend actually advocacy for your client. Your job is to do, do justice. The best way to illustrate that is this practice um, when the Solicitor General truly confesses error in a case. And here's how it works. So, you're a U.S. attorney, a assistant United States attorney in Cleveland, and you lose your suppression motion, and you want to take an appeal to the Sixth Circuit. Good luck. Um, and um, uh, and how do you do that? Well, what do you do? You first you write a memo to your boss, the U.S. attorney, says, "Boss, I lost this. It's wrong legally for the following reasons. I want to appeal." The boss reads it. The U.S. attorney writes her memo to the Solicitor General saying, we should appeal this because it's legally wrong for the following reasons. It then gets shipped off to Washington, D.C. The criminal division reviews it. Uh, it's a criminal case, it was an environmental case, the environmental division reviews it. And the Assistant Attorney General writes his memo saying, absolutely, we should appeal or not appeal. And then it goes to one of the line attorneys in the Solicitor General's office, one of the 16 of them, and she writes her own memo saying it should be appealed or not appealed. And by the way, all these memos are being seen by everyone. They're all shared over email. There's no stovepiping. So everyone sees everything and everyone can react to everything. You can write replies and so on. And so the line assistant to the Solicitor General writes her memo. Then a deputy Solicitor General writes a memo on top of that saying the appeal should happen or not happen. This is the process for every single appeal in the United States uh, for the U.S. government. And then it goes to the Solicitor General who makes the decision. The best thing about being SG, you don't have to write a memo. You just get to read them all and make a decision, okay? So, so that's the process. And so it's designed again to try and harness that checks and balances idea. But sometimes it isn't gonna work. Sometimes the SG will authorize an appeal and will argue the case to the Sixth Circuit and will win. The government will win in the Sixth Circuit um, as they sometimes do. And then the 
Solicitor General looks at it afterwards and realizes that's wrong. We should have lost that case. We shouldn't have won. What do you do then? Do you trust the adversary system and hopefully the other side will write a cert petition, the criminal defendant, and maybe the Supreme Court's going to take it? The odds of that are really low on every score. So the Solicitor General actually files a certiorari petition saying, grant this case, we won this case, we actually should have lost this case. And they argue against the U.S. government's interests. And the court, if they grant the case, as they almost always will in that circumstance, will grant the case and then appoint an amicus, a friend of the court, to go and argue the position the government would have taken, that the conviction should be upheld. And this happens, by the way, two to three times every Supreme Court term, and it happens whether the Solicitor General is, you know, some Democratic, you know, kind of let all the criminal defendants go, or some law and order Bob Bork or Ken Starr figure. It doesn't matter. It's not political at all. It happens at the same rate. Solicitor Generals, Democrats or Republicans, it goes all the way back to Taft, uh, 1891, who was the first Solicitor General to confess error. And so that's a remarkable thing. The insight here is that you can actually create an adversarial system even if the true advocate, the Solicitor General, isn't in the room defending that position. You appoint someone else to do so. So how does that apply to something like drone strikes? Well, right now, there's obviously a deep concern that this is going on without due process of law. It sometimes is even allegedly attacking United States citizens abroad. Um, how can we ensure that there is at least some input into the system from dissenting voices? Well, one way to do so is to think about creating an internal court within the executive branch, people who were assigned to argue what almost a defense attorney would argue. Now, it's different than a defense attorney. You can't call your client and say, oh, tell me why you shouldn't be, have, be subject to a drone strike. You know, there's none of that. You can't have any communications the way you would in an ordinary criminal setting because obviously you can't tip off the other side. Um, uh, you can't tip off the, the, uh, the, the potential target and so on. But you could create these kind of repeat player interactions in which you're forcing each side to justify their positions. And obviously, if you're kind of arguing against drone strikes and you're always arguing and making ridiculous positions as a repeat player, your credibility is going to drop over time. But if you, you know, husband your credibility right the way that the Solicitor General generally does with the U.S. Supreme Court, um, you might be able to make a difference there. Similar thing could be done for electronic surveillance and the like. That, to me, is a lot better than the solution that's being bandied about now, which is federal court review of possible people on the assassination list, which sounds just absolutely nuts to me, the idea that federal courts would be in the business of trying to review targeting decisions and military decisions uh, of the United States. So conventional separation of powers I don't think is going to work in that circumstance. But the question is, can we take the insights of our founders, adapt them to some new way of thinking about this? Let me give you, um, you know, maybe one other example uh, of, of what I'm talking about here, a somewhat different example. Um, the Office of Legal Counsel. So the Office of Legal Counsel is this elite organization at the Justice Department, and it has two functions. There's about 20 attorneys. One function is to advise the president on hard legal problems, um, like do the Geneva Conventions apply to the war on terror? Are we at war after September 11th? Really hard problems like that, advise. The other is to actually adjudicate, as a judge, internal executive branch judge, these disputes when agencies disagree about a legal question. To me, those views are, th those, or when the president, maybe if the president disagrees with a part of a, you know, an agency or something like that. To me, those, you know, it's kind of these, these roles are somewhat in tension with each other. Because if you're, you know, adjudicating disputes, um, you're trying to, you know, you're obviously going to sometimes upset people when you do, the loser. And you're, if you're the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, the last person that you're going to want to upset is the uh, president, because what, what can the president do then? He can just not seek your advice at all. So instead, I think we should think about kind of fracturing uh, the role of the Office of Legal Counsel, having 
you know, a judging function, an executive branch judging function that's carried out separately from an advising function. And then maybe one last example to talk about. This one I think maybe is a little easier to get your mind around. Uh, the, the, just something to highlight, the State Department's dissent channel. So this has been around since 1971, since Secretary of State Rogers. And what it is, is it allows any person who works at the State Department anywhere in the world to blow the whistle and say, I disagree with what we are doing in country X or policy Y or whatever. And to have that cable read by the elite Office of Policy Planning, our, you know, our top officials at the State Department, and then reacted to. And actually this Foreign Service Association, our Office of Foreign Service Officers, gives an award for the person who uses the dissent channel each year in the most effective way. And so that's a really good example, and maybe I'll just conclude with that, of trying to say, we celebrate dissent. We can learn from dissent. We want people to come forth, our civil servants to come forth, and tell us as political leaders what we're doing wrong. And so, you know, I think today, a lot of times when we think about advancing peace and freedom, we tend to focus on non-governmental organizations, things like the media and transparency, but I don't think we can neglect governments themselves. Um, we can take, I think, the lessons of the founders uh, in our government and build upon them. And to me, the strongest of societies recognizes that governments, like all humans, are going to make mistakes, and the true measure of a great nation is what they do about those mistakes. So, thank you. the moderator's prerogative uh, to ask a uh, okay. question. Okay. So one question might be that we, we do some of this with the offices of inspector general mm -hmm. in the various departments. And a, a critic of that system would say um, administrations okay. learn that dissent may make, help make better decisions, but it also makes, may make bad headlines. It may also be uh, uh, create political difficulties. And so we see inspectors general not getting appointed. We see the, the appointing of people that aren't going to be very critical of an administration, and, and in what ways what you're describing different from what some would say you've tried to do with those offices and some would say have failed? Yeah. So um, IGs, uh, great question. IGs, I think, don't work very well. Um, they don't work well in part, I think, you know, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, but they don't work well in part because if you're a really great attorney, I think it's pretty hard. You have to be a really specially committed person to want to go work in the IG's office because basically they are places that don't have the respect of, of, um, uh, of the agency um, or of the government more generally. And so the question is, how do you change that culture? Well, it seems to me one way of starting to change it is to do what the CIA did, which is to say, we're trying to value, we're trying to actually, you know, let's start to the top, we want you to come forward with your criticisms and the like. And the IG problem is marred by the fact that they're also uncovering waste and government waste, and there's so much bureaucratic red tape about in, in agencies. People, you know, violate all sorts of silly rules, and then there's like, you know, month-long IG investigations. I kid you not that when I argued the case in the Sixth Circuit, the health Obamacare case here, I took a cab to um, to the oral argument. It was only four blocks from my hotel, but I had two big, huge, um, you know, uh, bankers' boxes of, of, of papers, um, and so uh, and so I couldn't walk. And for like six, I left the government soon after that. For like six months, I kept on getting justify the eight dollar cab ride you took, you know, for these these letters. I'm like, I'll pay the eight dollars. I'm in private practice. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and they're like, No, no, no. You got to justify it. Like, so you know, they spent you know you know a long, long time. MapQuest picture. I was like, here's a picture of me with two bankers boxes. You know, so so you know, uh, you know, it's the, unfortunately the IG stuff gets wrapped up into that, and that's a different problem. It's not that I'm saying that there isn't waste and corruption in the executive branch. Of course there is, but if that's what they're known for, they're never going to build the cadre of people that I'm talking about. And I want to see that cadre built, and not just in one agency like the CIA, but all through the federal government. And so, you know, part of the book will be trying to create almost an elite core of folks across all the agencies 
that actually do this and perform this function. Two questions. The first is when you talked about the confession of error uh, that you uh, administered uh, the Appian Solicitor General, uh, is there a mechanism by which the Supreme Court can reconsider that case given the passage of time and the passage of parties? And then the other, which is a cousin of Professor Adler's example with the IGs, is that I often see in my practice, say, with state administrative agencies, that the so-called administrative law judge process within agencies that's supposed to be independent really isn't at all. That it's about rubber stamping whatever administrative action has come and those cultures develop. They're very hard to shake. You describe more elite processes in some of our mm -hmm. most elite institutions. How could one replicate the latter rather than the former? Yeah, great question. So on the first part, um, you know, I, I, I call the confession of error for for Korematsu and Hirabayashi, but it wasn't really formally one. It wasn't like that practice I was describing in which, you know, you go to the court and say, grant this case in reverse. Those are live cases. Hirabayashi and Korematsu are not live cases anymore. So it's only kind of a rough approximation of a confession of error. There are people who've tried, including last year, to try and file in quorum nobis petitions and this and that at the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't think, you know, that's necessary. I mean, um, you know, the decisions are discredited anyway. I mean, and, and no, no, no reasonable person would cite them for any, you know, any of the horrific propositions um, in, in those cases. Well, I should say, barring what happened in November. Um, but, um, uh, you know, but, but I'll be deported, so, you know, good luck. Um, um, so, um, but I think as a matter of law, you know, I don't think you need to, one needs to do more than that. Um, um, but um, I thought it was really important that, um, that for a matter of government lawyering that the record be set straight because I just want to make sure that, you know, that, you know, that that mistake comes out to light and everyone sees it. And, you know, the historian Peter Irons had FOIA'd a lot of these documents to bring them forward, um, and, but I thought the story needed to be told um, more than that. Now, your other question, which is about cultures of capture that happen within agencies, is a really serious problem. Jonathan's written about it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very deep problem, and I don't know that this is going to work for everywhere. We're not necessarily going to work for all state agencies um, and the like, but I would say this. If you're worried about capture, it seems to me the best check on capture is actually rival risk jurisdiction and some sort of institutionalization of dissent. So let me give you an example. We were really worried as a people about big companies exerting their influence in Washington, D.C. over antitrust. So what do we do? We say there's actually two agencies that regulate antitrust. It's the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department's antitrust division. And by having rivalry jurisdiction, if the companies have bought off one, they haven't necessarily bought off the other. And so two is harder. State and federal policing is another example sometimes. Um, you know, if some big bank in Washington, in, in New York, has influence with, for example, the feds, uh, the U.S. attorney, or something like that, then they might not with the state regulators. And so, you know, rivalrous jurisdiction sometimes can accommodate the capture problem. It's not by any stretch going to work perfectly. Um, but um, again, sometimes we're in the realm of second best solutions, not first best. To kind of summarize, it seems that I see it, uh, recurring patterns of this problem of the truth catching up with political expediency. Um, and it's like I said, a pattern. It's, and I think your solution and your talk today tells me that there is possibly a solution to that. Yeah, yeah so it's a great question. I do think that, look, I mean, all of us, don't want to hear criticism. You know, it's a very natural thing, so we shouldn't expect anything less from our leaders or anything more from our leaders. That's going to happen. Um, so one way that our founders said, well, if we have free speech and free media, the free press, 
will get some of that out. So some of the secrecy is going to be pierced. Um, one thing that I'm really worried about, though, is the one is, is a mechanism that I think is getting a lot of favor today toward uncovering uh, bad stuff, which is the whistleblower. So sometimes I think whistleblowers are really important. I've defended whistleblowers and the like. But, you know, whenever you have an intelligence whistleblower, for example, a Snowden or something like that, the result is to compartmentalize the intelligence information even more. And so it's already a pretty narrow group of people who are making these decisions. And when you're worried about leaks, the tendency is to keep that information even more closely held, fewer people see it, more groupthink develops. And so what I'd like to see is those whistleblowers be empowered within the executive branch so they don't have to blow the whistle, so that they actually make their arguments have them voiced and heard, and they're not always, government's going to make mistakes, but maybe they'll make somewhat fewer mistakes, and the pressure to whistleblow will be reduced. But sometimes you're still going to have to do it, you know, Pentagon Papers, something like that. You know, I'm not saying it's never a solution, um, but, um, but I think what we should be trying to do is figure out all the different safety valves to try and make sure that that last resort thing is truly a last resort as opposed to what I fear it might have been a much more easy resort in some of these intelligence leaks that we've seen. Okay, well, please join me in thanking Professor Cottrell. <laughs> and uh, we have a reception uh, in the lower rotunda, so please join us for that, and we hope to see you again soon at one of our upcoming events. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, even though you joined the Andrew Grant, if you want to test drive some of the stuff, like do a series.